The reading comes from John chapter 4, starting at verse 4 to verse 26. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near to the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you said is quite true. So the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, my name is James. I'm going to speak to you this morning about being gracious to yourself. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we just invite you to be present with us this morning. We particularly ask that your spirit will be here with prophetic insight and understanding. And we just want to open up our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I, I, I want you to imagine a big circle. And I'm going to call this big circle a circle of faith. So the closer you are to the center of the circle, the closer you are to Jesus. So you'd imagine the most religious people, the most faithful people would be right close to the center. But then there are people who are on the edges of this circle. And those people on the edges, maybe those are the people that struggle to imagine God exists at all. And um, if they have a passing thought that God does exist, they, they can't imagine that God is interested in their lives on a personal sense or interested in the circumstances they are facing. And in John 4, we have a remarkable story 
of Jesus meeting a woman at Jacob's well. And this is a story about somebody whose life is at the very edges of this circle. As a woman, she is disadvantaged. She has fewer choices. She is more vulnerable to poor treatment and exploitation. She is someone who is distanced in a formal sense. In Jesus' days, um, there was no opportunity for, for women to have pathways of discipleship. No opportunity for them to, to participate um, in religious leadership groups. And at, at the temple, they were, they were physically distanced from God. There were, there were courts and, 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 and barriers. There was distance. And this is a woman who was distanced from God because of her gender. And the woman that Jesus meets is a Samaritan. And so she's a Gentile. She's a foreigner. Um, she's outside of the chosenness of God's people. So she is again towards the edge. And through her presence at the well on her own in the middle of the day, and through the conversation that she has with Jesus, we know that she is somebody who's living on the edge of respectability, that she had made some morally questionable decisions in her life. And it's evident that she wasn't welcomed by other women of the area. Uh, women generally would go to the well um, for the collection of water at the beginning of the day. They would go as, as family or fellowship groups. It would be an enjoyable activity to start the day. Water was an essential for life. You know, you'd need it for washing, you'd need it for cooking, you'd need it for, for, for cleaning. Um, so that was a, a beginning of the day task and it was an enjoyable thing in many ways um, to, to the women of that, that community. But she wasn't there at the beginning of the day, in the cool of the day, when it would have made more sense to do this um, physically demanding task because she didn't belong. She was on the edge. She didn't belong. Um, she'd made life choices that were detrimental to the community that she lived amongst. And she wasn't welcome to be part of this. So this woman, in many ways, is a full representation of somebody living on the edge. She's isolated, she's rejected, she's unpopular. And in our imaginary circle of faith, Jesus at the center... Um, because of who she is, because of the choices she's made, she's as far away from Jesus as we can imagine. This is the story that John wants to tell us. Jesus, John wants to tell us how Jesus deals with somebody who's as far away from being a religious person, as far away from being a Jesus kind of person as you can imagine. Could we have the next slide, please? So in this circle of faith illustration, we, we could replace Jesus with grace. So instead of having Jesus at the center, we could have grace. In John's gospel, when the, um, Jesus' visit to earth is announced, we read that the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. So if Jesus full of grace, then instead of Jesus, we could have grace in the center of the circle. Full of grace. So there is no aspect of Jesus that isn't marked by grace. His thoughts are full of grace. His emotions are gracious. His words, his words collectively act as a definition of grace. His choices their grace in action. The verse also says that he is full of truth as well as grace. So the grace that Jesus brings is, is flavored with truth. 
This means that Jesus' grace is real and full of integrity. It's not an imagined false grace, it's a truthful grace that Jesus brings. And if we take a step closer to Jesus, we take a step closer to experiencing grace in our life. Our decision to take a, a step closer to Jesus is in essence being gracious to ourselves. So we're starting to answer the question before us this morning. There are four key points in the passage that we've looked at. And um, so I'd just like to quickly reference each of these four points. So the next slide, please. And the first point is that Jesus is a prophet, full of insight and understanding. Now, we know that in two ways from this passage that we have in front of us. We know it in one way because Jesus, whether through his prayer in the morning or whether God has spoken to him in a, in a special way after his breakfast, Jesus knew that he had to be at a, spe a specific geographic point at a specific time of the day in order to have a specific conversation that God wanted to have with a specific person. It's a very specific thing. God also didn't want the disciples getting in the way. So Jesus had to ditch his disciples. Sometimes the disciples got in the way. And Jesus wanted to have the kind of this conversation with this woman that was most appropriate for him to have on a one-to-one -one basis. So um, Jesus ditches his disciples on this occasion. So that is, is uh, prophetic in terms of the presence of Jesus at Jacob's well at the moment the woman is there is prophetic. And then we see during the conversation itself that part of that conversation is about the woman's marriage status. And Jesus knew something about this woman that was, would have been hidden hadn't, had God not revealed that to him. So Jesus has, comes into this situation, prophetic insight, and knowing, knowing the woman. And as a prophet, Jesus sees a woman who feels that she's not important. As a prophet, Jesus sees someone who doesn't fit with the crowd. As a prophet, Jesus sees someone who has become lonely and isolated. Jesus sees somebody who the people look down on. Jesus sees someone who is a long way away from God. And this story is included in our scripture, in John's gospel, because Jesus wants us to know that when people think they're not important, when people don't think they fit, when people don't, are, 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 are lonely and isolated, when people are looked down upon, when people are a long way away from God, then God wants us to know that Jesus will have special meetings with people like that. That Jesus loves special meetings with people who are on the edge. That Jesus wants people to know they're not overlooked. They feel so very far away, so very much on the edge, but they're not overlooked. Jesus wants to know that he will go out of his way to meet with people like this. Jesus wants us to know that he's interested in people like this and what's going on in their lives. The next point, who we are and what we've done. Slide four, please. Next slide, please. So Jesus is more interested in who you are than what you've done. I don't know whether you've tried to really impress God, but he's actually more interested in you than your activity and your actions. The, the woman's life had become defined by harmful choices. The woman had learned she could attract men. 
And I'm sure that the ability to attract men made her feel desired, it made her feel loved, it helped her to feel worth. Um, and her choices to have multiple relationships ensured that she had a home and was provided for. We may look down on her decision, but if we were faced with abject poverty, then we too might make harmful choices. Rachel last week explained about some of the harmful choices she heard faithful people were making in Africa when she um, had recently visited there. This is a person whose life, to some extent, is defined by harmful choices. And some of us here today might think that harmful choices are actually a big part of defining who we are. But Jesus brings a ministry of redefinition. Encountering Jesus redefines who we are. Encountering Jesus redefines who we are. And the most important definition of who a human being is, is someone loved by God. A human being is someone who is loved by God. If you're going to be gracious to yourself, own that definition. Re re reject the other things that are defining you. To own that definition, um, a definition we can all enjoy, we have to resist people, we have to resist things, we have to resist powers that take over us and shape us. They will shape us in, in different ways and in harmful ways away from that loving definition. And that truth is captured in the words from Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. And using the J.B. Phillips translation, it says, don't let the world around you, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold you. Let God redefine you. And this is, it is an, an internal reshaping that is on offer from God here. Not an external molding, but an internal reshaping. Could I have the next slide, please? Point, point three from this passage. Jesus makes an offer to the woman. So at the, at the center of this story, Jesus makes the offer to the woman. And the nature of the offer that Jesus makes is a gift. Jesus' offer to the woman on the edge is a gift. Jesus' offer to all of us is a gift. The nature of a gift is it's not something that can, we can earn, it's not something that we deserve, and it's not something that's based on where we're positioned within that circle of faith. It's a gift. It's a choice that the giver has made. It's a choice that God has made. And the character of the, the gift is life-giving. Life-giving. Just as we would die without access to water, so without this life-giving water that Jesus is speaking about, we would die a spiritual death. It's not an external gift. It's a, it's a heart and soul gift. And if you can imagine, um, at a time that you've been most thirsty, and you take that water, and it's sweet, and it's satisfying, and it's wonderful, well, Jesus is using that as an example because he wants this life-giving, this internal life-giving heart and soul gift that he's got for us to, to have the same dimensions to the experience putting ourselves in a place where our spiritual first thirst can be quenched um, is the very heart of being gracious to yourself 
You can be gracious to yourself by allowing your, your, your spirit to be quenched with the gift that God gives. So how do we put ourselves in that place? Let's try and be as practical as we can about this. Could I have the next slide, please? This is point four. And at this point in the account, we get what seems like a strange twist in the conversation. Having heard about the gift, the woman then wants to talk about worship. I don't know whether you've ever thought about that. How did we get from water to worship? Well, if you read this passage, that will help you, help you to understand how you get from water to worship. Now, like many parts of the Bible, if we choose to spend time meditating and reflecting on the words, the, a revelation will take place. A revelation in our thoughts, a revelation perhaps sometimes at an emotional level. God, God is a prophet. Jesus was a prophet. This is a story about the work of a prophet. The words of scripture will bring insight and understanding into our lives as this life-giving water enters our lives. And there is fresh truth when we experience those things. And it was fresh truth for me when I reflected upon this part of the, the passage. So there are two matters in hand here. So having recognized that Jesus is a prophet, the woman says, here's an opportunity to ask a knotty question um, that people are talking about when it comes to worship. And the question is, where is the best place to worship? You know, on this mountain, that's what the Samaritan fathers would say, worshipping on this mountain is the best place to worship. Or in Jerusalem, which is where the Jews would say is the best place to worship. And Jesus' answer to this knotty question, this question that religious people had been talking about for a long time, was, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's not the building. It's not the mountain. It's not the where that matters. It's the who that matters when it comes to worship. It's the who that matters, not the where. And then the second matter that it comes out of this. So now the woman... You can, I can just imagine when I picture the scene that this heightened spiritual curiosity has overtaken this woman at this point. And um, she links worship with being in the presence of God's chosen one, the Messiah, um, our, our explainer in chief. That's fantastic, isn't it? We've all got questions. We've all got questions about faith. We've all got questions about our beliefs. And Jesus is the explainer in chief. Uh, the one that we can ask um, the difficult questions of life. And she wants to know when she will be able to encounter um, the presence of the explainer in chief. And Jesus says, you already have. It's me. So through the conversation with the woman at the well, Jesus, in his answers, um, answers the question that we're exploring today. How, how can we be gracious to our, ourselves? And there are three measures we can take. The first measure is be gracious to yourself by recognizing your true worth. You are a person that is ultimately defined by God's love. Be gracious to yourself by receiving this love. The second measure is be gracious to yourself by quenching your spiritual thirst. Be gracious to yourself by accepting the life-giving water that Jesus offers as a gift. And the third measure, be gracious to yourself by experiencing more of Jesus be gracious by getting yourself closer to Jesus through expressing worship imaginatively, creatively, focusing on the who and not the where. And just as a final thought, 
On good days, the acts of worship that I've spoken about will be like spiritual water that quench our, 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 our spirits at the deepest level and help us to feel alive and close to God. Those are the good days. On bad days and in more challenging times, acts of worship will be like spiritual water. They're still spiritual water. They will immerse us in grace, even though we might hardly recognize that we're immersed. On those days, we worship as an obedient act towards a loving God. But be reassured, this act of faith will help bring us to a healthy place, a place of grace. We'll be able to be graceful to ourselves by, um, through the act of worship. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you um, for Jesus' encounter with the, the woman at Jacob's well. We thank you for the truth that came through that encounter. We pray, Lord, that we'll own that truth this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.